as the number of viewers to this channel has grown, we've seen an increase in the number of people reaching out and asking questions of the team. Sometimes it's a question that we can answer in a jiffy via email. Other times we think it's something that would be beneficial to others. So we put the question aside to eventually make a video about it. And today we're answering a few questions about car buying advice, leasing, commuting, and more. We're going to start with Matthias Nockman, who reached out to us at the end of October with a question about leasing or buying a BMW i3. He writes, should I lease a new BMW i3 or buy a used one? Leasing will set me back approximately $9,000 over three years. And in comparison, a used i3 is now $15,000 to $20,000. What do you estimate a 2015 i3 will be worth in 2021? Thanks for the question, Matthias. And this is a fairly common question from viewers. In answering the whole lease versus buy question, I think it's important to ask yourself what you want out of the car. Do you want a vehicle that you can hand back or sell on? Or do you want a car that you're happy to drive for an extended period of time? Usually I recommend leasing an electric car because it helps protect you from both battery degradation issues down the road, but it also covers the pain of discovering that your three or four year old electric car has now got an obsolete battery pack, a tiny percentage of the new car battery packs. If the car you're buying suits your requirements, however, and you have no desire to sell it anytime soon, then buying the car probably makes more sense in the long term. It can also make more sense if you want to invest money up front in a vehicle and prefer the freedom of not having to worry about mileage limits on your lease. If that sounds like you, then you should certainly buy a used one. The other benefit here though with a BMW i3 is that if you buy the battery version rather than the Rex version, BMW does allow battery upgrades for larger battery packs if your car's existing battery pack isn't large enough or healthy enough. As for the valuation, well, that's a tough one. Given the i3 is likely going to get a refresh before 2021, I'd value it at less than 4,000, depending on range and condition. I hope that's helped and let us know what you decide. Our next question comes from Timothy Taylor in San Francisco, who's reached out with a question about which car to buy next. He writes, I'm a recent college graduate who's working in Apple retail about three miles away from where I live in San Francisco. I'm currently driving a 2006 Mini Cooper S and it just isn't made for this city. It doesn't seem logical to keep this car. Mind you, I get a new car every year and a half or so as I go through different parts of my life. But with an electric car, it would be different. My thoughts are buy a certified pre-owned BMW i3 Rex, this will be about $20,000, keep my insurance the same and not break the bank. Or do I want to wait for a new Mini E, which has no specs or release dates yet? If I do the i3, it gives me some time to save money and get a new job and purchase a nicer new electric car, like a Model 3, which is what I want. Does that sound like a good plan? Or what should I do? Hi, Timothy. My first question, honestly, is why you have a car in the first place. If you're commuting to and from work every day and have just a three mile commute, you may find yourself better off with a bicycle, electric or otherwise, and save money that way. Given that parking is an absolute pain in San Francisco and there are already several car and scooter share services there, I'm also wondering if you'd consider dumping your car and getting a scoot plan instead. I scooted earlier this year, there's a link to the review right here, and I found the service to be super easy, simple to use, and while it wasn't all that fun when raining, was certainly less hassle than trying to find a parking space. One way you could test this all out would be to list your Mini Cooper on a site like Turo and lease your car out for a few weeks to visitors to San Francisco. You'd earn money in the process and you could then use that money to pay towards a Scoop membership for a few months. Insurance, helmet and training are all included and you may find that you don't actually need to keep your car after all. But by keeping your Mini and leasing it out, you're also ensuring that you have a transportation solution at the weekends and on your days off. You'd also get to travel most of the time in electric awesomeness while saving up for that Model 3. You know, the one you really want. Let me know which one you choose. Our final question comes from Steve Baker in Australia, who's been trying to get this question answered for a while. Sorry, Steve. He writes, I'm planning to get an EV soon. I'm in Australia, so right now the choice for new EVs is limited to the BMW i3, Renault Zoe, and Tesla Model S and X. However, the Ionic is due for release later this month, the Kona Electric in March next year, and the Leaf 2.0 in Tesla Model 3 expected mid-2019. The Kona appeals to me the most, but I was wondering about the high cost. 
Currently, the top-of-the-line internal combustion engine Kona Highlander costs just under 41,000 Australian dollars drive away, and early indications are that the Kona Electric will probably cost 54,000 Australian dollars on the road. Based on what little information I can find about costs per kilowatt hour to package a battery, it seems that the 64 kilowatt hour battery in the Kona Electric would cost between 14 and 18,000 Australian dollars, which, if accurate, accounts for the difference in cost between these models. What I can't reconcile, though, is that I would expect a simple electric motor must be easier and cheaper to produce than a complex internal combustion engine and drivetrain. How is it that the EV costs so much more than the internal combustion engine, even taking into account the expensive battery? Well, Steve, it's a good question. And although I think your battery prices are a little low, the answer right now lies in economies of scale. Internal combustion engines are produced in the hundreds of thousands, and often different variants of the same family of engines can be found in vehicles spanning a decade or more. As a consequence, initial development costs for said engine family can be spread out over a really long period of time. Also, the tech to produce them has been around for years, and frankly, automakers really know internal combustion engines and how to make them. With electric motors, however, things are different. Comparatively, making traction motors is a new thing to most automakers, and they're having to invest a lot of time and money getting those designs right. And while the actual physical motor is mechanically very simple, there's still a lot of design engineering that goes on to ensure the motor itself is built to the correct specifications for the job it's going to be used in. It's also not just the motor. In order to ensure the electricity from the car's battery pack is properly sent to the wheels as motive power, there's a lot of engineering and design work that needs to go into the power electronics and inverters that turn the DC current from the battery pack into the AC current that causes the motor to spin. And again, this all costs time and money. Right now, there's simply not enough electric motors being made by your average automaker to get to a point where economies of scale have dramatically impacted price. It's coming, but for now, the cost of developing these new drivetrains is still being passed on to the customer. And until automakers begin making a profit on electric vehicles, right now only Tesla is apparently doing that, we'll see those prices remain higher than internal combustion engine cars. So there you have it. Three questions answered as best we can. And if you've got some questions of your own, please do reach out. We know our contact form on the website is currently broken, but we are working on getting that fixed ASAP. That's it. Don't forget to give us your thumbs up or your thumbs down. Leave a comment. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. As always, thanks to our Patreon supporters, without whom we'd never be able to produce all of this daily content for you to all enjoy. You can join them for yourselves by going to patreon.com forward slash transport evolved. That's it. And as always, keep evolving.